was probably still in December this week. I finally got all those Christmas decorations put away. Unfortunately, I'm still dealing with all the food I ate over the Christmas time. The turkey, the dressing, the fruitcake that came from my Newfoundland sisters-in-law. And yes, turtles and turtles and turtles. I wish the pounds could be taken away as easy as the Christmas decor. Well, there's some traditional Christmas dishes, and probably like your culture, there's unique food items that uh, you have on occasions. Uh, some of those cultural foods are good for us. Well, others, they taste really good, but I'm not so sure if they are good for us. The Newfoundland culture has something called scrunchions. Anybody know what scrunchions are? Oh, there's a few people. There's a few people know what scrunchions are. Well, here's a picture. Scrunchions are basically salted pork fat cut up in little small pieces. And when they're put in the frying pan, the rendered fat and that good liquid fat gets poured, drizzle, drowns a dish. Well, we call fish and brews, or you could put it over potatoes or something like that. I was explaining that to my daughter one day, Melissa, and she went, Ew, Dad. That sounds like a heart attack waiting to happen. Well, maybe there's some food items in your culture that's, yeah, they taste good, but they're not so good. As good as we perceive these foods to be, uh, similar foods like this, the medical profession would probably say a regular diet of these items are certainly not good for our bodies, and we need to take better care of our heart and work towards a healthy heart. That physical heart, the very core of our physical existence. Well, spiritually, shouldn't we have that same desire to take care of our spiritual, healthy heart, the core of our very spiritual, godly existence? We need to care for that spiritual heart. Physically, there's potential for our heart to be affected. Well, what we put into our bodies can certainly mess with us and limit those opportunities that are available to us down the road. When it comes to spiritual matters, it's no different. What we bring into our lives can have that same effect and cause us difficulty in our spiritual walk. The heart is, again, the focus of the message from Hebrews chapter 3. And I say we need to do everything possible to avoid a spiritual heart attack which limits our relationship with God and can even remove us from the promises that God has for us. Allow me to pray. Lord, thanks again for your word. Thank you for the promises that are in your word that are for each believer. So, Father, we thank you for that. Lord, we also thank you for the words that you provide to us that help straighten us, to help correct, that warn us of the dangers that we can have in our own lives. Father, we don't want to miss out on what you have. Help us to be obedient, open to what you want to lead and direct us in. In Jesus' name, amen. The title for today, yeah, you can take that picture off the screen there, Jordan. Just Our title is Heart Matters. Our sermon series in Hebrews on the superiority of Christ continues in Hebrews chapter 3. In the book of Hebrews, we will discover that the writer uses positive, negative examples. He will use words of encouragement. He will use words of warning. As he directs us toward Christ, there will be words of correction and words of warning to believers. Last week, Pastor Josh, in leading us in the first part of Hebrews chapter 3, I won't go into it much other than to say that the first few verses of Hebrews chapter 3 talked about Moses. Now, Moses was a fantastic person who was used of God. Some high points in his life, some low points, but God still used him. The readers, the hearers of these verses in Bible times would hold Moses in high esteem. And then early in those verses in chapter 3, again, Pastor Josh says it, the writer says it, that as good as Moses was, that Jesus Christ, God's son, is superior above all, above every person, superior than any person. Moses is good. There's good people. But Jesus Christ is 
superior. We are to trust God. We are to follow the example of Jesus, who again is superior in every way. Listen to these words in Hebrews chapter 3, words of warning. We go from verse 7 through 11. And it says this, This is why the Holy Spirit says, Today, when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as Israel did when they rebelled, when they tested me in the wilderness. There your ancestors tested and tried my patience, even though they saw my miracles for 40 years. So I was angry with them, and I said, their hearts always turn away from me. They refuse to do what I tell them. So in my anger, I took an oath. They will never enter my place of rest. As I was looking at that scripture, my logical mind says, as you look at a passage, you start at verse 7 and then progress. But my eyes, my focus kept going to that last phrase. They will never enter my place of rest. They will never enter my place of rest. What could have happened for this group to have those words said to them about them. God's rest isn't the goal to spend eternity with him. Isn't the goal for us to enjoy everything that God has promised. His love, his grace, his mercy all points towards you and I, the Israelites, receiving everything that God had promised for them. I trust that your desire to enjoy, to receive all that God has for you. It almost seems ungodly that a loving heavenly father would follow through on such a statement. And yet, isn't that what God's character is about? What he says he will do. Earlier in chapter 3, we were given the positive examples of Moses and Jesus. And now the writer jumps directly into a negative example. We move from Moses and Jesus to a group of people who made mistakes, and the premise is that we, the readers, the hearers of the word, would learn from this example and not fall prey to the same outcome. We've heard this phrase before, we learn from our, we learn from our mistakes. I've done it. You've probably done that too. There's some good things going on, and we receive it, and then we make some mistakes, and I go, boy, I got to learn from that. Today, even though this phrase was written centuries ago, they are still very applicable to today. It was directed at the hearers of that day, but let's not kid ourselves. We are able to learn today from this portion of Scripture. Verse 7 says, that is why the Holy Spirit says, the New Testament believers were aware of the Holy Spirit. They realized the link with the Holy Spirit with divine inspiration of Scripture. The author uses the present tense, the use of the word today. Today, we are able to make choices and decisions. Today, he says, don't harden your hearts. The purpose is to get our attention, the urgency that today is the moment that we do that. Words of warning to not harden our hearts. Well, what exactly are these verses referencing? Well, there's certainly a history that's been there. And that history provides us a look at God's holy heart. The Old Testament records, they show that the Israelites were in captivity in Egypt. God does some, some amazing miracles and they are released. They are now free to follow God, to receive the promises that he has for them. Free to enter the promised land that God proclaimed for them. But as they take that trek, they get close to their destination, and then they realize that that promised land that God had for them, well, it's inhabited by somebody else. Well, they say, let's go check the land out. So they send out 12 spies for 40 days to see how it is, to see how they can figure out the battle, all of that, what's good about the land, all of those things. Well, out of the 12 spies that go out, two of them returned and faithfully and confidently proclaim that in spite of the big enemy, in spite of the formidable odds, with God, with God, we can go in and conquer and defeat 
the enemy. With God, we can advance and receive everything that God had promised for them. Well, opinion back then is no different than it is now. There were 10 other people, 10 other spies along the way. Well, they saw the opposite. They saw the big giants. They saw the enemy. They saw the fortresses. They stated that it wouldn't be wise to go up against the enemy. Well, the result was a 40-year wilderness sojourn, a year for each of those 40 days. That took place because the nation of Israel did not believe that God would come through. They didn't believe that he would deliver on the promise to provide a land for them. If you look at the book of Numbers, specifically chapter 14, it shares the outcome of the spies' report. And when the report is given, the whole community, Scripture says, complained and began crying aloud. Basically, they say, why do we want to go in and fight when we're going to lose this battle? Why didn't we stay in Egypt or at least die in the wilderness as opposed to going into a battle and dying in battle? Why didn't? Why? Why? They complained. Why did this happen? Well, verse 11 of Numbers chapter 14, it says, The Lord said to Moses, How long will these people treat me with contempt? Will they never believe me? Even after all the miraculous signs I have done for them. Moses' response was to ask the Lord to pardon the sins of the Israelites. God's a loving father. Verse 20 says, Numbers 14, says, I will pardon them as you requested. But the Lord continues and he says, but as surely as I live and as surely as the earth is filled with the Lord's glory, not one of these people will enter the land. They have all seen my glorious presence and the miraculous signs I performed both in Egypt and in the wilderness. But again and again, they have tested me by refusing to listen to my voice. The chapter continues that only the two spies who gave the good report had the opportunity to enter the promised land. And then the Lord does say that those who are under the age of 20 will also enter the promised land. The Lord's response was, yes, I will forgive their sins, but the rest, the promised land that he had for them, the joy of entering that promised land, the joy of entering into his promises, his rest, would not be theirs. When the people heard what God had said, what do you think their response was? Well, I know when I was a little guy and I was asked to do something and I didn't, and dad came around after, I knew there were some consequences coming. What I was asked to do earlier all of a sudden, I went, nope, I'll, I'll go do that. Uh, no. Or if I wasn't supposed to do something, I said, you know what? I am going to follow through. Well, I had a father that followed through on what he said. The people's response, verse 40 of Numbers chapter 14. So after hearing what the Lord has said by not entering the promised land, by not listening to him, Here's what it says. It says they got up early the next morning and they want, went to the top of the range of the hills. And then they said, let's go. We realized we have sinned, but now we are ready to enter the land that the Lord had promised us. Folks, we serve a loving heavenly father, but he's a just God with a holy heart. He will follow through on his word. The good things and the challenges, the results of our actions, he will bring that into account. In this case, when they say we're going to go into the land, the result for that group was disastrous. And I say, why is it we have such a tough time submitting to the Lord's leading? When he asks us to do it now, we go, well, I'm not really sure. But when that's over, I go, well, maybe now. Why is it so difficult for us to understand that it's in God's timing and not in this guy's, not in my timing, not in your timing? What I'm supposed to do, I don't. What I shouldn't do, I do. The Israelites long ago, the attitude is no different than this gentleman standing before you 
Because sometimes we want to do it. It's our timing. God's timing is not right. I believe it's this timing. One writer summarized this account this way. He says, God had promised them victory. The land he commanded them to go in and take was already theirs. They simply had to trust and obey. But this they did not. God will never lead us where his grace cannot provide for us or his power cannot protect us. Indeed, the Israelites had seen the powerful work of God at work during the plagues, the miracles in, in the Exodus. And yet, like many people, they walk by sight and not by faith. And their unbelief displeased God. The failure to believe in God's word kept them from entering the promised land. And that truth has never changed. Verse 8 of Hebrews chapter 3 says, Don't harden your hearts. Well, what could a hardened heart look like? What could a spiritual heart under attack look like? It's probably an attitude that does not trust God, that does not believe that God will take care of you. It won't trust that his direction is good. A heart that says, I believe I know what's right for me. I'm not sure if the path that God has me on is the right one. No hope in God's ways. It's a heart of unbelief. That hardening of a heart could include rebellion, testing, sinfulness, mistrust, missing out on God's promises for you and I. The danger of unbelief is not receiving God's rest, not receiving his promise for you. God's rest, next week's message in chapter 4, deals a lot more about the rest that we can enjoy. The danger of unbelief is not receiving that rest, those promises that God has for us. God's desire is that you and I receive everything, everything that's available to us because of the almighty God that we serve. Amazing promises for each one of us. Verse 8 continues, and it says, Do not rebel like the Israelites did and test God. Do not rebel against God. One writer said, When wandering in the desert, the Israelites became thirsty. And what was the result of some of this? They began to disbelieve God, distrust that he would care and provide for them. They began to murmur and grumble against God and against the leader, Moses. They began to regret what they had left in Egypt, the good things about Egypt. And I say the benefits they had in Egypt while they were in captivity. They're in captivity, and they begin to miss the comforts of that captivity. They did not believe that God would take care of them. They lost their trust in God, began to criticize God's leader, Moses. In the journey, God provided for them, protected them, and their approach almost became like, well, what have you done for me lately? You provided last week, you provided yesterday, but, well, I'm facing something today. And they wanted God to prove himself all over again. Irregardless of what happened yesterday, they still say, nope. Here I'm facing today, can you do this today? Did not believe, did not trust, did not have the faith that says, God, I saw you take care of me, and now I need you to do it again. It seems absurd that they would take that approach with an almighty God who's able to provide. They saw that happen. And yet, I won't ask for hands, but we've probably been guilty of the same kind of an attitude. God, if you do this, then I will serve you. If this wasn't happening in my life, then I would be free to honor you, to celebrate you. In order for me to tithe, I need a raise. If, I want, if you want me to do this, you need to do this. Almost that, what have you done for me lately, God? Why is it you can't do that? A hardened heart goes astray. Even though they, saw they were the recipients of God's care and provision, 
when it came down to it, they weren't willing to put their ongoing faith and trust in him. Instead of believing, they said, we don't think that you're going to do it. And God, that unbelief, that's what God was displeased with. Didn't believe and didn't put their full faith and trust in him. Nikhil read it earlier in chapter in Psalm 95. It recounts that same uh, story that we read. The verse gets repeated. And they mention two places, the names there, Mirabah and Massah. And this was the account where the Israelites were complaining about the lack of water. And they started uh, whining to Moses. And he began to feel the heat of the people. So he says, you know what? We had water in Egypt. The people were saying, we don't have this anymore. We want water. We need this. Well, Moses went to the Lord. The Lord told Moses to go to a rock and command water to flow. The end result, there's a whole bunch of other um, meanings in there. But the end result was that the Lord allowed water to flow and their thirst was quenched. But initially, initially the people did not believe that God would take care of them. The end result was they received the water, their thirst was quenched. Mirabah, the name means quarreling or strife. Massa means testing. These were moments and places where the Israelites quarreled, where there was disagreement, strife, where they tested God. And these were the moments that came back and they said, Mirabah and Massa, places where God was questioned, where God was tested. Have you ever questioned God's ways? Have you ever tested God? What could be the signs of a heart heading to be hardened? Maybe church isn't always as important as it used to be. We talked about reading our Bible. Maybe Bible reading, maybe prayer is not a priority like it used to be. Maybe there is some complaining, withholding finances, criticizing the work of God, lack of faith, not supporting. The scary part of all of these verses about hardening our hearts is that these thoughts and words in Hebrews chapter 3 were directed at the believers. The latter part of Hebrews chapter 3, verse 16, it says, Who was it who rebelled against God, even though they heard his voice? Wasn't it the people that Moses led out of Egypt? A reminder, folks, that if we don't keep our relationship with God a focus, a priority, we can be in danger of leaving our heart vulnerable to attack. The repeat of these scriptures, Psalm, it says, don't harden your heart. Hebrews chapter 3, don't harden your heart. Hebrews chapter 4, next week, it will say it again. The focus next week won't be on hardening our hearts. It'll be on the rest. But that phrase gets repeated again. A reminder that those whose hearts were hardened were those who experienced freedom from captivity, were part of divine miracles in their lives instituted by God. They were led and directed by God. They followed after God. And yet, these were the ones that the scripture was being pointed to. Don't harden your hearts. So I say to myself and to you, let's not allow ourselves to make this journey about myself, just about us. Do not allow the enemy to find a way into our hearts, at our very core, where those attitudes can be developed like the Israelites. Let's not question God's plans. Let's not allow it to be just about myself. Maybe someone else we think is getting all the blessings and we go, what's going on over there? I'm faithfully, what? Allowing our circumstances to overshadow our faith. Let's not allow that to happen a former pastor here, Pastor Yvonne, she used the phrase several times. And she said, in your walk with God, finish well. When you're on the journey, finish well. The Israelites, 40 years, that's a generation pushing two generations. They had seen God work. They experienced God. Some of you have been along the journey for a while, been on the journey for a while. In the midst of all of that, we've seen God work, know how he leads and directs. Let's finish well. Let's allow God to continue to work in our lives. 
So that's the good news. Scripture says, don't harden your hearts. We still have a choice. We're still able to make decisions. We still have opportunities to change, to get back on track, to readjust those priorities. God's saving power can transform a hardened heart. Romans chapter 12 and 2 says, let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. How do we keep our hearts healthy? How can we avoid getting to that place of a hardened heart? Well, it's like most things. It begins with you and I. It takes a humble heart that says, God, I need you. I believe you have some amazing plans for me. You promised me an abundant life. A humble heart says, here I am. I want to follow after you. Not about me, but about yourself. Help me to follow you well. Hebrews, the 12th verse of Hebrews chapter 3 says, Be careful then, dear brothers and sisters. Make sure that your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving, turning you away from the living God. Philippians chapter 4 says, His peace will guard and keep your hearts as you live in Christ Jesus. Jesus has to be our primary focus. Placing our faith in him, that's where relationship starts with God. Hebrews, in our series, will continue to reinforce the person of Jesus Christ. That relationship begins with him. And yet, in addition to that foundational truth of believing in Christ, there's a couple of things. We've sort of mentioned them already today. Foundational things that help keep our hearts healthy, help to allow us to grow in our walk with God. Bible reading, studying scripture, meditating. We've said it several times already. Praying is so important in our lives. That cultivates our relationship with God by praying and being obedient. One of the things we get caught up in is being in such a hurry. And one person says that sometimes when we're in a hurry, that creates a barrier to a deeper relationship with Christ. We rush everywhere when we don't take the time to get to strengthen our walk with him. Intimacy with Christ comes from entering his presence with inner peace rather than bursting into his presence from the hassles of life. When we neglect what God wants to do in here, we risk, we leave ourselves open to the force of evil, to what's out there. We leave ourselves open to what the enemy wants to do by reading, by praying, by being obedient by being faithful, making choices in our obedience that are, that's based on our trust in God. Those are the things that strengthen my walk, that keep my heart healthy, that keep my heart focused. And there's less chance of me wavering and going off and missing out what God wants to do. I would like to add that sometimes our emotions can be front and center. I don't have a problem that cultivating intimacy with God, there's times when life circumstances happen that we can have a heavy heart or we can have a hurting heart. Circumstances, there can be grief, there can be sorrow, there can be frustration, moments of anger, even failure. But here's where the important part is. Even in those moments, that's when we need to learn and trust and put our faith in God that says, you know, in the good times, I trusted you. But boy, what's going on now? Instead of going, I can't believe that's happening, and going, well, God, you're not taking care of me. That's when we need to say, God, I don't quite get what's going on here, but I'm still putting my faith and trust in you. I'm not sure where it's going, but my faith and trust is in you. So in those moments of a heavy heart, of a hurting heart, we still, well, we must put our trust in God, place our faith in him. Being obedient in those steps. Correspondingly, we must also reject sin, which also can harden our heart. James 4, 7 says, So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. If we deal with the challenges today, 
we won't get to that place of unbelief. Pastor Josh, one of his closing comments, even after his message last week, as he was here at the end, he said, there's nothing embarrassing about saying there's something in our lives. It's when we don't do anything about it and it is allowed to sit and stew. That's when it becomes an issue. So in those moments of knowing that there's something here, we have to just say, God, help me out, and I'm putting my faith and trust in yourself again. We need to allow God's word to work in our lives. Is there something that's going on that I need to confess? Is there something that I need to repent of? How can my life look this week based on what I heard last week? Not just what we hear, but then we have to act on what the Holy Spirit is leading and telling us. Faith is putting our, faith, our trust in God and being obedient, even when we're not sure what the pathway is down the road. In addition to a humble heart, I believe there has to be a hopeful heart, one that says, I want to continue to learn, I want to continue to grow. No matter what's going on, I'm putting my hope in yourself. And that hopeful heart says, God, we're in this together. I'm glad you've called me on this journey with you. And God, I have hope that down the road, you're always going to be there with me. Folks, gathering together like this is another way that we can be strengthened. Being encouraged by fellow believers. We prayed together this morning already. That's the beauty of being with fellow believers. You encourage, you encourage me. We encourage each other. The latter part of Hebrews chapter 3 reminds us that we can't do it alone. Verse 13 says, You must warn each other every day while it is still today so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. It continues, If we are faithful to the end, trusting God just as firmly as when we first believed, we will share in all that belongs in Christ. Isn't that our desire to share in everything that God has available for us? I need you. We need each other to pray for each other, to encourage each other, maybe to say at some point, hey, I notice, and maybe call us on some things. That's where we need each other to say, we're in this together. We want to enjoy God's blessings, his promises together. I want to enter into God's rest. I want you to enter into God's rest. We need each other along the journey. At the beginning, I mentioned the food. And if we do not pay attention, the results can take a toll on our physical heart. Uh, physically, many of you go do some exercise. You go to the gym on a regular basis. And I thought on this Super Bowl Sunday, we would close with a sports illustration that hopefully gives us a little bit of a picture. What's my favorite sport? Ah, there's a few of you that know me. Well, well, I do enjoy hockey. I still play on a regular basis, play every week. Last season, there came a point where my skates just weren't cutting it anymore. One of the blades broke. I had to go looking for a new blade. They really didn't have one in stock. I had to wait. And um, it took me a while to get these skates fixed. So I said, you know what, heading into the new season, I'm going to get a new pair of skates. So somewhere around, I don't know, August or early September, I went out, dropped some very reasonable dollars on skates. But the season came along, and the season started. Well, I started the season with the old reliable cracked skates. And the first few games went well, good, comfortable. But then I said, you know what? I have these brand new skates that should help. So I decided to let the old ones go. And I brought out the new, really nice <laughs> skates. Well, I wore these for a couple of games. First game, boy, they cut into my ankle. My foot was bruised. I couldn't even do some of the things that I did so well. Skating for me, if everything came as easy as skating, 
well, life would just be a, such a smooth journey. Some of the things that I could do so well, taking a turn, just didn't happen as good as it did. These offered better protection? Well, I tried that. Wasn't going good. So what did I do? You know what? My game wasn't as good. I was missing stuff. I was actually, you know. So what really was that? It probably was my pride because my game wasn't as good as what it was before. So what did I do? Pulled out the old reliable, the comfortable ones, the ones that I were used to. Granted, the next couple of games went better with the old skates than with the new ones. But then the logical part of me says, Rob, you spent some good money on those skates. They're supposed to be good. So I said, you got to do this. You got to trust the new skates, give them a real effort, and go for it. So pull the new ones on again. Can I tell you that those first few games were really difficult? My foot still got sore. I had to change the way I put my knee pads on because these were so sturdy, just didn't fit right, so I had to change that. There were times when I would go into a corner and do something that I didn't even think about before, and this time I would take a turn, and the skates would just fall out from under me, and I would just slide into the corner. And my teammates, I'd get back to the bench, and they'd go, Rob, what happened? I went, just be quiet, please. <laughs> I gave them a real effort. So probably after about, we're probably pushing three to four weeks. Feet didn't hurt as much. Actually, because these are sturdier, I could make the turns even quicker and tighter than I did before. Because they're made of a much stronger material, I was much more confident in going out to block a shot, things like that. The new skates, after a few weeks, became exactly what I wanted them for. Really good, really well. It was not without some pain and difficulty and discomfort, but I've settled in, and the last few weeks, the game is going well. I'm back to contributing to my team the way I wanted to. Folks, sometimes change is not easy. But in the long run, it is better. If we are to move forward, if we are to see the superiority of Jesus Christ fully working in our lives, in the lives of our church, we need to realize that God has everything under control and that we are the ones that need to adjust along the way and say, Lord, help me, give me strength. I'm putting my faith and trust in you. I want to do what you want. Some changes may be more difficult than others, but let's make sure that spiritual matters, heart matters are a priority. I'm going to invite the worship team back, and they're going to lead us in a few moments of the song that you sang earlier, I Surrender all. Why is this scripture in Hebrews important? It's a reminder that God has promises for us. It reminds us that we are to make decisions today. Don't leave decisions later on when they need to be made today. It's a reminder that if we allow it, sin can creep in and push out godly priorities and affect our spiritual heart. It does remind us that God has an abundant life full of promises, but we can affect that outcome. It's a sobering reminder that God is a God who's one of his word, that he will judge. He did it in the Old Testament, the New Testament, today and in the future. God will bring our actions into account. I'm going to ask you just to bow your head for a moment. Psalm 96 and 2 says, examine and try my heart. I believe your heart matters to God. Our heart matters to God. We sang it early. He loves us too much. And like Troy mentioned, first when I saw that, I went, what? But then to realize, God loves me so, so 
much. He loves you so much. Amazing promises for you. Folks, I don't want to miss out on what God wants to do and his promises for my life, for your life. Make those matters a priority. And I just ask you, what actions, what choices do you need to make to ensure that your spiritual heart is strong and healthy? What are some things that you need to do, maybe some changes, some adjustments along the way that can allow God to work in your life and for you to fully receive what he has for you? If there's some things that, as I've been speaking, and something in your mind, you go, I need to be dealing with that. I should be doing that. I'm going to pray in just a moment, but if there's some things going on in your life and you just say, Pastor Rob, yeah, I need to make some changes along the way. Not easy, but I need to do that. Would you just raise your hand and then we'll just pray in just a moment. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Folks, whenever I stand here, I'm reminded that we're no different. I get an opportunity to share God's word. We're on the journey together. When you raise a hand, mine was probably raised earlier in the week when I go through this. Lord, all over this place, Lord, by us raising our hand doesn't help you to know what's going on in our lives. Father, you know all about it. Raising our hand just signifies that there's something going on and I'm acknowledging that. And God, by doing that, we're placing our faith and trust in yourself, that you will help us out, that you would meet the need, that you would give me strength, confidence, boldness, that you would forgive, that you would help me deal with the thing that I'm seeing right here. God, I believe that's your Holy Spirit speaking into people's lives. Lord, raising our hand doesn't mean that we're going to do it ourselves, but we're asking for your leading, your directing in our lives. Father, we don't want to get to that place where our hearts are turned away from yourself. We want to be drawn even closer to you. So Lord, thank you for helping us. Thank you for meeting those needs. Thank you that we're not alone, but you're always with us. We want to put our full trust in yourself and receive everything that you have for us. Folks, I'm going to ask all of us to stand as Troy and the worship team lead us in this song of surrender. Maybe you didn't raise your hand, but this song says that right here today, I surrender all. Whatever's down the road, whatever needs to happen, that I'm saying, God, help me out. I'm giving myself to you, and we're in this together. So as Troy leads us, let your heart say, God, I'm surrendering everything to you. I want you to do what you want to do in our lives. Come and do what you want.